on the flight deck. Crews are now manning for the next launch. Time to clear the flight deck and catwalks. Stand well clear of all jet blasts, prop parks, and exhaust. It's time to start up the GO aircraft. Let's start them up. This is the F-14 Tomcast. We're going in depth with the people who made the Tomcat a legend. In today's first episode, we're gonna talk with Grumman test pilot, Kurt Schrader, who has some incredible stories and inside history on the development of the Tomcat. So strap in and get ready for launch. Hey, welcome to the F-14 Tomcast. I'm Dave Baronic, call sign bio. I was an F-14 Rio and I have 2,500 Tomcat flight hours and three squadron tours. I was also a Top Gun instructor from 1984 to 87, and I'll be one of your co-hosts for the program. And my name's Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch. I also have about 2,500 flight hours and 650 traps. I too was a Top Gun instructor. And after uh, about 24 years, I retired out of the Navy and I now fly for a major US airline. And today we're gonna talk about the, uh, the beginnings of the F-14 and the F-14A. And today we're joined by Mr. Kurt Schrader, one of the original F-14 test pilots from back in the very beginning of the, pro the program. Welcome, sir. Hey, well, thank you, Crunch. It's uh, great to be with you. So, Kurt, as we get started here, uh, I just if you could tell the audience, tell the folks, you know, what's your hmm. background? You know, you're, you're one of the original F-14 test pilots. Got it. You did some stuff before that. What what brought you to the point where all of a sudden you're involved in the F-14 program? Well, I, I, my college education at the University of Wisconsin was on the NROTC program. So I was commissioned upon graduation. Uh, I spent a year in the Black Shoe Navy before I was able to uh, request orders to flight, flight training. And so I went through that and it happened in the era that I went through the whole training command and uh, something like a year and a half, which I think in today's standards is pretty quick. Uh, but like everybody uh, in the program, when I, I still remember uh, the initial gathering of every, all the new uh, enrollees, if you will, in the training program in a big auditorium. And they said, how many people here want to fly jets? And virtually all the hands went up, not all, but most of them. And uh, he said, well, I want to let you take a look at the person on either side of you. And neither, if you're successful, neither one of them will be with you. So that was the big issue. What, what happened later in the program as you went through flight training, as you began to realize is what kind of community are you going to get ordered to when you get your, your finally awarded the wings. And obviously in the jet community, it was, fighters and attack. And so there was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to go to fighters. And the way the system was, was uh, structured is uh, in theory, the, if you're number one in your class, then you get the first pick of where you want to go. That sounds like a good process, except that it turned out that there were weeks where there were no openings in the community you wanted to go to. And then more frustrating is the following week, someone else who didn't have nearly the academic or the grades coming out of the training command, there were more billets available and they got what you wanted. So anyways, I, I wanted fighters and uh, fortunately I was uh, given orders to a F-8 Crusader Squadron out of Oceana, which kind of uh, uh, gave me uh, a lot of confidence in the whole system because on my preference card, I said, I'd like to fly F-4s out of Miramar. So <laughs> uh, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I, uh, the Crusader community is an is a organization onto itself. And... Uh, 
there isn't a single person that was got involved with the airplane that didn't love it. And so uh, the squadron I, I was very fortunate to go to, BF-33, was a very strong uh, squadron in terms of the pilots and also the skipper and the air wing commander uh, were just unbelievable and really strong leaders. Uh, a lot of people will recognize the name Jack Christensen. Christensen. He was our air wing commander and there, he was like a guy out of a, a, a book, uh, just wonderful. So I made one cruise in the Crusader and then we transitioned as a squadron into the F4. Good timing. Well, it depends. I, you know, oh. it, once again, it meant giving up the F8 and what have you, but it was inevitable. And uh, so I, I spent the tour uh, in, the, in 33. And then uh, at, toward the end of my, my sea duty tour, uh, I was selected to go to test pilot school. And so that's where I went out of the squadron to Pax River and through the school, which is a, a, a wonderful experience. But it was difficult for people coming off of sea duty and explaining to their families that now I'm on shore duty, so we'll be able to do all the family stuff and only find out that they were working uh, long, long hours just academically to get through TPS. Uh, huh. Coming out of there, there's several different assignments you can get. And once again, I was very, very fortunate. I was assigned to the flight test division, but specifically the carrier suitability uh, branch of it. And that was a absolute wonderful experience. At the end of my text- I'm just gonna comment this for, the, for listeners, because yeah. I know a little bit about your career. But some of the things that you said, I mean, flight tests or test pilot school and carrier suitability branch now, those really paid dividends later in your F-14 career, didn't they? Yes. In your F-14. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just wanted to point that out to you. <laughs> well, not, not surprisingly that uh, there's the military or DOD test pilot community. And then for brand new airplanes and airplanes that are trying to be uh, purchased by DOD, there's a civilian community. And not surprisingly, the civilian companies, uh, when they need personnel to hire, they obviously go to your military background. And, and the one thing that I, both of you are well aware of is everybody has a reputation in the naval aviation community. And so basically to me, it's a fairly easy task for them is, is they go to their contacts and say, hey, we need, we need somebody, we need to hire somebody. Who, who in the community should we be, be going after? And uh, so eventually, I, uh, when I left the Navy out of Pax River, I uh, joined Grumman. And this was in 1972. So once again, going back to the historical records of the, of the F-14, as everyone's aware that the first flight of the airplane was in, I believe it was in December of uh, 70. 1970. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, the first flight was essentially uh wasn't of any value as far as learning something about the airplane. It was essentially, yes, we flew in the airplane. Uh, Bob Smythe, the chief test pilot, essentially took it once around the pattern and landed. And so the next flight on that airplane was really, in all reality, the first development flight on the airplane. And that's the flight that didn't end well uh, because uh, of course, we had chase airplanes. The airplane got airborne and somebody, uh, one of the chase airplanes said there's some hydraulic fluid on the bottom of the airplane. Uh, a, a, a poor decision was made 
that it's probably residual fuel because during the buildup of the airplane, obviously you have hydraulic leaks and it can get into a portion of the airplane that's hard to clean out, but with the airflow of being airborne, that it would come out. So, uh, but as the hydraulic leak continued, the decision was to recover the airplane. And uh, the flight took place at Calverton on Long Island. And the airplane was essentially on final to come in and, and flying the airplane at that time was Bill Miller, who was the project pilot, who was wonderful, who deserves a whole lot of credit for the success of the airplane. He was flying the airplane and you can hear the cockpit uh, conversation of that the airplane stopped responding to the stick uh, movements and what have you, obviously meaning that the hydraulic fluid had been depleted to the point where it wasn't functioning. And they both ejected at a very low altitude and the airplane went into the ground and and uh, in a fire, assume, uh, in the fire there was some concern of the, uh, the two occupants of going into the fire. As it turned out, the wind took them out of there. But that caused a lot of, as you might expect, delays in the program. So even though I arrived there nearly two years after the first initial flight of the airplane, the program was just really getting started up. And uh, so it was, it was good timing for me at the time. That's a good point, because if it, if you're in all those delays, I'm sure there's not a whole lot of flying going on. There's an awful lot of sitting in conference rooms with engineers and talking through issues rather than actually flying them because you're trying to figure out how to not to repeat that. Sure. Is that yeah. right? And, yeah. And, uh, you know, basically, if people aren't familiar with a development program. There's the first uh, roughly 25 airplanes off the line were devoted to some phase in the development program. Uh, the first airplane that we lost had to be replaced. And it's also important to understand that these are airplanes that are designed for a specific test mission, which has to, the instrumentation, a lot of it has to be installed as the airplanes in, uh, assemble, strain gauges and things like that. So, we replaced the number one airplane with the number 12 airplane, brought it forward. It got all the instrumentation, what have you. And then it was designated as 1X, which took the place of the number one airplane. And Interesting that each- I had never heard that yeah, before. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, well, so basically the, the very specific airplanes of the early ones is, 1X was the fine qualities and uh, high, what I would call the high speed airplane. The number two airplane was a high alpha airplane. And it was specifically designed to, uh, <clears throat> it had an EPU in it. Uh, nobody was really sure uh, what the consequences of taking the vehicle to uh, high angle attack and what have you. So it also had a spin chute uh, installed on it. And some of the things that the wind tunnel test, and, and people tend to be somewhat familiar with this, is that there was some concern about if the airplane departed control flight, it would go into a flat spin. And this is all the model in the wind tunnel. And so they said, well, okay, so in the ejection system is obviously the first thing that leaves is a canopy and then the rear occupant and then the pilot. So if this thing is going in a flat spin and it has a very, very small rotation, uh, axis of rotation, is it possible that they could hit the canopy itself? So the number two airplane didn't have a normal canopy. It had a much thinner canopy than production. 
And really? so it was, the intent was that you eject it through the canopy, which wasn't possible on a production canopy. So it also had on the uh, forebody of the airplane canards, which were one of the things is that an airplane is a part of, part of what drives, drives it is the airflow over the forebody of the airplane. So these were canards that could be extended uh, that would break the airflow around that. So all of these were uh, uh, conservative approaches to make the airplane as bulletproof as you could. Number you know, three, I'm sorry. Well, before we get away from that, I, I want to make a clarification, which um, these are not the glove veins that were part of the production airplane, but they were little rectangular canards. I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking to see if I have a picture of them in this, in this book, but I don't. They're small rectangles on the nose. So, okay, right. on the number three. And a whole different different purpose than what I mean. Yeah. So number three was the structural airplane. So that is, you know, I, I mentioned that all the instrumentation or a good portion of it has to be installed, the string gauges and everything, during the assembly of the airplane. So uh, number three was, you could call it envelope expansion, but it was the structural airplane. And number four ended up to be a weapon system airplane that went to the West Coast and uh, Hughes operated that. Number five went to the West Coast and there was a growing contention out there. And so five was a, call it a weapon system airplane and some of the initial clearances for captive or carriage of bombs and things like that. Six also went to the West Coast, seven, was kind of an interesting thing is that seven was pulled out of the production line. And one of the things that is a whole long story, and we'll get into part of it, is the initial intent of the airplane when when Grumman got the contract is the airplane was designed around a Pratt and Whitney engine, which was common to the same engine that the Air Force was developing for the F-15. And it was a, a, a much higher, I don't remember the exact thrust level, but it was considerably higher than a TF-30. So th the Navy looked at the development progress on this engine, and they decided that if they had to wait for that engine before they ever flew the airframe, it would be a, a, the Navy would not get the airplane nearly as quickly. So a decision was made, well, why don't we put TF-30s in the airplane? Not that we intended it to be the engine of production, but strictly to get the, the development airplanes flying. And the original intent, I believe it was aircraft 31, was going to be the F, the first big engine airplane. So the first, first 30 airplanes were all TF-30 powered. So uh, the characteristics of the TF-30 were already known because they've been flying around in the 111. And uh, one of the uh, uh, <clears throat> real concerns with it is the compatibility of the engine. They, you can look at it as a stall tolerance of the engine. So it was known, it was accepted as saying, we can live with that to get the airframes in the air because we don't, we're not going to live with that for very long. And so that was number seven was set aside to be the big engine test airplane. So it was just sitting on the side. And then eight went to Pax River and we used it somewhat. And I won't go through the rest of them, but we went all the way up into the 20s of production numbers that went to various places that had a function in the whole development process. But the major ones were 1X, 2, 3, uh, and, uh, and then I omitted the carrier suitability airplane, which was aircraft 10 in the, in the production cycle. Once again, 10 because it was essentially a structural demonstration in the catapult and arresting gear all had to be instrumented well back in the assembly kind of thing. So uh, those were the major airplanes in, it, in the process. 
Kurt, that is, that's an amazing recap. And I think, you know, I think people are going to be just uh, surprised at, at all those little details you just mentioned. But, but before we carry on to the F-14, you said F-111. You mentioned it uh, briefly, talking about the TF-30. Can, what are your feelings about, you know, the F-111B? Uh, did you ever see one? I don't think you flew one based on your timing. And, and how did that help Grumman with the F-14? Well, as it, as it turned out, when I was still on active duty at the Naval Air Test Center, the F-111B had arrived. Uh-huh. And I like, to, I like to make a joke about it. They said, well, did, did you have much involved in it? And, and I, I say, well, there were a couple of times where I would be in, in an F-4 or an F-8 in the whole short area, and the 111 would taxi by, and I'd be aware of it because the whole world would tilt in the direction of the airplane going by. It was, it was, it was recognized from the beginning by everybody involved on the, in the development area at PAX that this was not going to work. Obviously, it took a long while for, for the uh, powers that be to recognize that. But uh, it was for multiple reasons a a bad idea and uh but did it help grumman with the when it came time to make the f-14 didn't that experience help grumman well really i mean trying to put a positive spin on it one of the smartest things grumman did was the navy project pilot at fax river was a gentleman named bill miller and he was the epitome of a test pilot and as soon as he got involved with the airplane itself, he made it very clear this wasn't going to work. But then, shortly after that, he left the Navy. Guess where he went? He went, Grumman hired him. And so Bill was involved from the Grumman standpoint very early. And I, I'm not sure exactly where it was, but it was before the airplane had ever uh, it was fairly early in the development area so Bill Miller was a consummate test pilot because in my mind what he did he was technically marvelous and so in my mind that's what a test pilot's all about he not only has to see what the hell the airplane does but he's got to know number one how it's designed to operate and then, which allows him, if something's not working right, to have an, ed- an educated guess of where the problem is. So, Grumman came in, and I, I'm not familiar <clears throat> with the entire involvement, uh, but Grumman was the obvious choice to get the F-14 contract. And in relation to way Things like current programs, F-35, and what have you, the the time frame, calendar time frame. The F-14 was really, uh, the contract was was led, I believe, in the late 60s. And the airplane flew in in 1970. So it was unheard of. That's pretty fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, very fast. For those who aren't familiar with the, you know, the lead time in the development of a fighter, it it can be a decade to go from, you know, concept requests for for ideas and then they build it out until you're actually building airplanes. You know, and that's it, you know, things are done differently now. Back then they would build prototypes, I think, for for some ideas. Uh and nowadays it's all done on computer and we buy stuff up that's virtual, I think. <laughs> well, they they've been able to truncate some of it. But, you know, basically, the spec on the F-14 was a multi-mission airplane. And there are design elements in the, in the F-14 to, to, uh, that were used in the development of the airplane to address the air-to-ground mission. However, naval aviation is made up in two general communities. There's a fighter community and an attack community. 
And I can tell you the enthusiasm of the fighter community for any anything that went into the design of the F-14 to enhance its air to ground was not supported. I mean, I, the constant thing was not a pound for air to ground. That's what they used right. to say at Miramar when I was in the early days of Miramar in the early 80s before, you know, anyway. So, yeah, I'm with you. That was the attitude. Well, that's right. I mean, something that was proven later in the life and the service life of the airplane, the airplane is an excellent air to ground machine because, you know, what are you looking for in air to ground? <clears throat> the obvious things is you want something that can go a long way, can carry a lot, can deliver it accuracy, accuracy, and has a structural strength that if you don't expend it, you can bring it back. All of those describe the F-14. It didn't describe the other alternatives in the attack community. And so the, uh, <clears throat> the, later on, that when, when the airplane got really involved in the air-to-ground mich- uh, mission, that I think it's well acknowledged that it was probably the best platform on the, on the carrier deck for that mission. So, so is it true that so is it basically the F fourteen kind of like the the first attempt at no kidding a multi mission fighter where we actually went forward with it? Well, they they did, and you guys are familiar with the fact that the airplane, you know, it had all the wiring in it to handle the air to ground munitions. Uh, mm-hmm. That, from a structural standpoint, that when I'll use carrier suitability as an example. The dictate was anything you can get off the front end with, you've got to have the ability to bring it back. And one of the concerns was the Phoenix missile, is that because of the cost of the Phoenix missile, if you launched with it and didn't expend it, you didn't want to have the requirement to jettison it so that you could land back aboard the ship. So we cleared everything on the airplane, including Mark 84s and for arrested landings and what have you, which was right. kind of unique to the airplane. Yeah. So, so for the listeners, uh, they may not realize this, uh, an AIM-54, if my memory serves, was 1,013 pounds. Does yeah. that sound about right? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And a Mark 84, that's a 2,000-pounder. Yes. Right? So there's these are big, big weapons. And, and an F-14... Uh, I don't, I'm sure it was, uh, I'm, I'm sure you did the, the testing for it. I mean, you could carry six Phoenix. You might not be able to recover with all six, uh, but you could certainly do that. That's six over 6,000 pounds of ordnance right there. Well, plus a few thousand more for the rails and adapters. Yeah, Those you're absolutely right. Heavy. That's true. But there, then you're coming up against the practical limit of what kind of gross weight can the airplane land at? It wasn't. Right. It wasn't that you couldn't land with them. It's just the obviously had to observe the gross weight limitations of the airplane. But you could bring an awful lot back. And yeah, and if I remember, so back back when when you were doing the initial carrier suitability, uh, the the gross landing weight for an arrested landing, I believe, was fifty one thousand eight hundred pounds. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And later on, it was increased to 54,000 pounds to yes. improve the, the carryback. Um, so I, obviously, you know, we could we could bring back a lot more ordnance later in the life of the Tomcat. But back in the beginning, even at 51.8, that was a pretty good bring back. But we we did expand that to give it even more capability because it well, was such a big airplane. It was amazing. You know, the, other, the other thing that people in the fighter community quickly realized that uh, when you're doing stuff like carrier calls and what have you, mm-hmm. uh, the F-4, the F-8 were restricted in how much fuel you could land with. And mm-hmm. and suddenly now you had an F-14 that the only restriction you had to live with was the landing gross weight. So, you know, you ended that, up with... That was a factor of the arresting gear, yeah. as I recall. Well, it's... It, yeah. All of these things interact, yeah. But yeah. you know, suddenly you had a guy that 
uh, could could actually do touch and goes and what have you at at a much higher fuel status than than was previously available. Yeah. So and so for anybody listening, I mean, you come aboard, you're coming around doing some initial carrier qualification. I, I know that we all think we are awesome and God's gift to aviation, but we might not be as good on that first or second pass of the airplane. And it's yeah. nice to have more than one look before you got to go hit the tank or divert to the beach. So having that greater uh, gross weight capacity allows us to carry more fuel. More fuel gives us more looks at the back end of the boat. More looks gives us the opportunity, more opportunity to land because it's not as easy as some of us make it appear. So there we go. Hey, now, Kurt, question for you. Let's let's go in the way back machine to when you first started. Uh, you first showed up at the program. I remember the first time I walked up to a Tomcat. Can you describe for us your first impression when you walked up to this thing, this machine, for the very first time? Well, let me cover a little detail. that uh, When I made the decision to leave the, leave the Navy, uh, I I got almost an immediate call from Grumman saying, we'd like you to come work for us. But I was a lot smarter at that time that, to me, uh, aviation was a uh, <clears throat> plus and minus kind of thing. If you work for a company that had the contract, you had plenty to do. But if you work for a company that didn't get the contract, then you were either going to change jobs or you're not going to be totally employed and what have you. So I said, no, I'm going to go use my engineering degree and I'm going to enter the business world, if you will, which I did. Uh, and I found out that it made me really appreciate the people that I worked with in naval aviation. I mean, suddenly you're, you're in a civilian environment and whereas you don't realize, I didn't realize how dependent you are on everybody around you in naval aviation. And fortunately, there's always a few that are kind of categorized as weak, but there are very few of them. And you depend on the ability of people around you. Well, I found that not to be the case in the civilian world is that you really didn't have a lot of, you had some reasons to doubt the, the people that you depended on. So anyways, I, w I was battling with, once I realized all this, Grumman was still looking and still wanted me to, to come to them. So my wife and I were having a discussion about this, about the demands that Naval aviation puts on the family and on the, and at that point I've got two kids, which I, my first tour uh, in the fleet, I was a bachelor. Do I have to tell you there's a difference between a bachelor and being a, a family guy on a cruise? So yep. anyways, uh, we were having this debate of whether, whether we should maybe do this. And uh, so one thing that happened was, and you guys are familiar with it, the Naval Reserve, Aviation Reserve, ended up, they transitioned into really talented outfits. And they had, down at, at uh, Miramar, they had two F-8 squadrons and a, and a supporting RTU flying F-8s. And so I got a call from them. They said, hey, you know, you're in the reserves, why don't you consider coming down and flying with us? And as you know, the whole way the way reserves are structured is I found very quickly the highlight to my entire month was the weekend I would go to Miramar and fly. So I'm now I'm leaning toward accepting Groman's offer. And Groman calls and said, hey, guess what? We've got a couple of airplanes at Point Magoo, F-14 said, we're going to be there for weapon system work and what have you. So why don't you take a trip up there and, and walk around the airplane, which I did. And the Grumman people that were involved in it, uh, Hal Farley was one of them that they gave me a tour of the thing. And well, you talk about setting the hook. 
basically, I called Groman and I said, yeah, I've, we'd be happy to accept your offer. So that's how I got involved with it. But uh, And it was still early enough in the program that to witness the development of the airplane because as we all realize, when the when the first airplane comes off the line, there were several systems in the airplane that really needed attention. And the attention was was certified by the flight test. And so the airplane evolved from the early airplanes that VF-1 and 2 took on crews. And the airplanes that came down the, the line later, there was a big difference. That's amazing. I mean, that's... <laughs> And and I bet it was a, a, a different world back then. So, Kurt, you mentioned uh, VF1 and VF2 were really uh, learning some developmental lessons. How about going into some details about that? We know they made the uh, the first deployments of the F-14 around uh, 75. Uh, tell us some of the, the stuff that you were, you're were you thinking of. Well, you know, it's like uh, basically they obviously had – early block airplanes. And the flight test program was being conducted before they left and while they were gone and what have you. Some of the early things on the airplane uh, was they uh, uh, basically the original airplane had maneuver, the maneuver devices were strictly trailing edge flaps and they were controlled by a thumb wheel on the, the pilot stick. And quite honestly, the additional lift and what have you it gave you was not impressive. And it was all manually controlled. So very quickly, it was identified as number one, we needed to include the leading edge slats as well. And secondly, is why not have them automatically controlled as a function of angle attack. And so then the question is, well, okay, what, how do you make it smart about the angle attack? And that's how, where the ARI probe, the probe in the, uh, in the radome came in. And that is an, essentially an angle of attack sensor. So I think there isn't anybody that wouldn't argue that it made a dramatic difference in the airplane. And so, you know, in an ideal world is you call up Nav Air and you say, hey, guess what we just found out? We just flight tested it and it's great and we'd like to put it in the airplane. Well, then that, that starts the process. But needless to say, it's a long time before it appears in the, in the fleet. And uh, I believe in this case, it was the... Block 90 airplanes, which were well down the production line. So they they also had a uh, a very uh, concerning. They lost an airplane that was when they were deployed, and the crew ejected. And as they described it, there was a thump, bang. Uh, followed by uh, a fire, and they eventually had to jump out of the airplane, which, because they were deployed, the airplane went in the water. So the question was, what caused this? But there, you have, you don't have anything uh, as far as AAR goes. You've got nothing to work with other than the, the crew comments. So, and it wasn't too much later than another airplane had a similar uh, episode. And there was obviously a lot of scrambling going on of what's causing this. And then we had an airplane that was, the Navy was flying out of, out of Pax River and also had a similar incident, but they they were able to land the airplane. 
So for the first time, they had something to investigate. And long story short, it turned out it was, uh, they were TF-30 kills <laughs> that they, uh, <clears throat> the fan blades were fatiguing. And if you've never seen uh, an engine or the fan blades are a significant hunk of material. I mean, it's not like they're, they're uh, featherweight and what have you. Plus they're spinning at a very high RPM. And, and there was enough energy and potential kinetic energy in the fan blade that went right through the engine casing. And unfortunately, there was a main fuel line that ran over the top of the engine right in that area, in the plane of the engine. So it was rupturing the main fuel line. Well, do I have to tell you what happens when you suddenly <laughs> bathe the entire nacelle and what have you with, uh, with, with fuel when you have, you know, engines running and what have you. So it turned out it was when they started looking at it, it was time related on the engines. They were all, I don't remember what the threshold was, but it was a very definite once they reached a certain certain length that the, a certain amount of engine time that it, the blades fatigued. So that was an obstacle they had to overcome. Uh, the, some of the things that, uh, once again, from a carrier suitability standpoint, uh, I had the uh, good fortune of when I went to Pax River and uh, carrier suit, we had the responsibility to optimize approach power compensators. And so the initial airplane that we worked with was the F-4, which is an ideal airplane to do that because the J-79 is a, essentially an axial flow engine with very quick power response. You come to idle and the nozzle opens, it reduces the residual thrust. So we, we were able to optimize the APC and the F-4 that I honestly felt I could fly as tight a pattern uh, with the APC as I could using manual throttles. So the next one in line became the F-8 because the F-8 came out with a major mod, the J. And once again, we went in to try to optimize it. Well, in the F-14, we wanted to do the same thing. But there's some real challenges associated with it is that the uh, number one, it's a it's, as everyone knows, it's a turbofan engine. So it doesn't re respond very quickly. The TF-30, when you come to idle in flight, the nozzle doesn't open, it stays closed, which means that if you're trying to decelerate the airplane, you've got residual thrust that you don't want and what have you. So we made some changes to it, but it was less than optimum. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing was the DLC. The airplane came off the line with direct lift control, and to, it was implemented that it used, uh, <clears throat> once again, in the way of background, the, uh, <clears throat> the F-14 has four sets of spoilers. They're all electronically commanded, and they <clears throat> are two inboards and two outboards. So we were using all the spoilers, for the DLC, and well, that and the, the point of the spoilers is to either dump or restore lift, and so basically, uh, the the downside of it is that when you're airborne and you put in a DLC command of that you want to go up, what happened is the spoilers. When to go up, the spoilers would stow, and there would be a significant uh, a shift in the center of pressure on the wing and a pitching moment that went down, right? 
So obviously you don't want that if you're trying to go up on the glide slope. So <clears throat> the way to counter that was there was a DLC interconnect, which was a device in the longitudinal control system that said with the DLC command, I'm going to command enough horizontal tail in order to counter the pitching moment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all, that's all good news. And it did a reasonable job, not a perfect job. But the problem was that the tail load, in order to counter the, the pitching moment, was in the wrong direction. And so basically you're trying for the airplane to go up, and yet you're commanding the horizontal tail, which is huge on the airplane, right. to give you a, 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 a uh, nose-down pitching moment. So, in my mind, the DLC was really, I, I personally, if I was in the fleet at the time, I wouldn't use it. But nevertheless, people did. And it's the, really, the, in my mind, the genesis behind the nickname that some of the LSOs attached to the airplane as the turkey. And you say, well... Turkey sounds derogatory, but it really had nothing to do with the capability of the airplane. What it was is when you had a guy on glide slope that was using the DLC and he'd thumb me in, he wants to go up, well, the stabilizers would, would make an immediate input to counter the pitching moment. And so basically the LSO is looking at an airplane coming down that has got these main gears sticking down, and then it's got these big horizontal tails that appear to be flapping. And I think that's where the, the, the term turkey came from. Kurt, I joined the fleet in 1981. Guys were talking about why they called it a turkey, but your explanation right there, I mean, Crunch, we could terminate the interview right now and go, okay, we've got to win. Because you, know, yeah, you right. told us where the turkey came from. Yeah. But we're not going to. No. Well, well so, so life is a is a mixed blessing. Yeah. The spoilers were electrically controlled, and then we had a rash of the electrical command path not behaving properly, which prompted us back at Calverton to do a try to isolate the problem, and lo and behold, we found out that. <clears throat> as far as the DLC goes, that all the benefit, excuse me, back up, all the bad stuff, the pitching moment, was associated with the outboard spoilers. So we said, and we had in the test airplane the ability to disable them, and we found out that if we use just the inboard spoilers and increase the amount of extension of them, that we ended up with a, a much more effective DLC and essentially no pitching moment. So if you flew the early airplanes, uh, I, I'm trying to remember when that fixed one in the airplane, but it's one of those things that you find something and you'd like to uh, have the fleet guys have take advantage of it right now. But it doesn't work that way because there's so many things that funding is an issue, when are you going to do the mods? What have you? So I think, I, I believe it was later rebranded the mod DLC. It actually okay. went in. It went in with the F-110 engine. Not that it had anything to do with the F-110, but it was included in that upgrade. I didn't realize so, it was that long before mod DLC was incorporated. I didn't realize well, that. Yeah. My my recollection could be wrong. It, I'm sure you're it right. wasn't. I just didn't realize. It was, it, well, I'm depending on my memory, which is, <laughs> you know. I mean, I so to so be clear, manual. all this stuff we're hearing today, this is all based on memory. You didn't study or practice or, or go. Well, let me go look at this stuff. You're not reading stuff right now. This is all just off no, your memory. I, from uh, my wife will tell you that I've ago. got, I have got footlockers full of information in the garage. But we just recently moved. 
and none of it's accessible. So uh, you don't need it. You're doing great. Yeah. Well, well, well hey, let me let me ask you if I may, Kurt. So you 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 talked about a few things. You were talking about approach power compensators. You've talked about direct lift control. You know, we're talking all this stuff we're talking about right now is all landing pattern, flying qualities, and it sounds like there was a lot of give and take and a lot of discovery because it's all new design, right? Um, how about Overall, I mean, it was built as a fighter and a bomber. And you're, now, granted, you you did a lot of carrier suitability, but you also flew it probably. I mean, did you get a chance to go out and do some some one v one, some dogfighting with it, and experience some flying qualities like that? Well, the closest I came, and it's a whole different story, is that I got sent over to Iran for six months to teach the Iranians to fly the airplane. Uh, that is more than this interview can handle. But we'll have you, know, you back. They, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, basically, uh, there are so many aspects to it uh, that as you discover these things, that it's it's frustrating that the time required to get it in, get it to the fleet. And the other thing is all these things are. Uh, uh, cost money. And, and I would make a general statement is the F-14 went through its entire life always, uh, let me state it this way, without an abundance of money. And, and so things that were on the table to improve the airplane and what have you, were uh, basically, for lack of funding, that they were either delayed or maybe they never got there. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a couple stories associated with that. But I, I think what I need to do is make everybody aware that the technology that was available when the F-14 was designed is archaic now. And specifically, flight control-wise, the introduction of fly-by-wire. What fly-by-wire brings to any vehicle is almost incalculable. Uh, Basically, the F-14 flight control system is nothing more than a mechanical connection between the stick and an actuator. So the pilot's not actually moving the surface itself, but he is setting a mechanical input into a selector valve on a big actuator that's moving moving the uh, surface. So basically, the, the, uh, when you put an input in, I'll use a, a stick input, and you put in four or half stick, as that input is going to go, and the stabilizers will always move symmetrically up or down, depending on which way you command it. But if you have fly-by-wire, that and the F-18 is a good example, a lot of people don't realize why when you see an F-18 taxiing around it, the, the rudders are towed in. Well, it has nothing to do with the flying qualities of the airplane. It's because they had trouble getting the nose off the ground on takeoff. So they said, well, we'll just tow the rudders in and create drag up on the vertical fin to give us a nose-up pitching moment. Well, that and the redundancy that fly-by-wire gives you is incredible. I mean, you have typically four channels. So things that we were dealing with that a single malfunction created a problem in a fly-by-wire system, if you lose one channel, it's no big deal. You've got three other channels working, and it can be addressed when the airplane gets back. So uh, basically what happened, I think is, is kind of an interesting thing. We get the airplane flying. This is after the, uh, and we're now into the flying qualities evaluation, right? So uh, one of the first things you did was do a level D cell pulling the power back and increasing F-stick to maintain 
altitude. And obviously the airplane slows down. And what obviously is happening is the angle of attack on the wings is increasing. Well, my experience in the F-8 and the F-4 is you would reach a point where you don't want to proceed any further because the airplane is going to depart. Well, in the F-14, they kept bringing the stick back and the stick back, and finally they reached full F stick, and the airplane is still sitting there. It's not departing, and obviously, if, depending on what your power is, sometimes even full military power won't keep it from descending. But the fact that you could go to full F stick and the airplane just sits there. So the next question was, okay, on a structural program, we have to define that the airplane is structurally capable of meeting the acceleration limits. In the case of the F-14, it was six, six and a half Gs. So they go out there with it with number three, structural airplane, and they start doing a, a wind up turn. And so what you're looking for is, as you do the wind up turn, turn is the normal acceleration on the airplane just is continuing as you as you decelerate. So basically, as you do this, the angle of attack on the wings increases, and therefore the loads on the wings, primarily bending modes, uh, increase. <clears throat> so if you have enough speed, you can reach a point where you're limited by wing bending. It just the wing can't stand anymore load on it. Well, when we, with the number three airplane, doing, doing these wind-up turns is that everything was linear in the cockpit, yet as they went to higher and higher angle attack, suddenly the wing loads start to drop off. You say, well, wait a minute, the G is increasing and it's linear but yet the wing loads are dropping off. What's going on? Well, it turns out, as we all know, <clears throat> the center body of the airplane is big. The wing glove area is big. So the lift was transferring to the fuselage. And so basically, this actually relieves the wing load. I never heard that explanation before. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. So. So basically, something we were we were trying to keep the information from from the fleet is the airplane symmetrically is nearly unbreakable. <laughs> Don't tell a pilot <laughs> that. No, <laughs> oh, we recognize oh, yeah? we recognize that right away. And, there are some and, airframers I know that are going to disagree with you on that. They're like, we've met Crunch. <laughs> I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. I know of at least two incidences where a pilot inadvertently, obviously, put 10 Gs on an F-4. The airplane, to its credit, it got home. But in both cases, it cracked the wing spar. And at that point, it's a, it's a strike, right? So here we have in the F-4, or in the F-14, is that as you increase, the fuselage load is actually relieving to the wings, right? So how strong was the airplane? Well, symmetrically, it was incredibly strong. And I had that proven to me in Iran when I was in the backseat on a basic fighting maneuver hop where we were the bogey. And I had an Iranian trainee in the front and we're doing maneuvering for as the bogey and we had a we had a floor that we altitude floor and we were getting down to it so i said to the to the uh the iranian i said okay we're getting down to the floor so start working it up in other words continue to do the maneuvers but but gain altitude don't be losing altitude well he leveled the wings, and we were at something around 350 knots or 375, and he buried the stick. 
<laughs> well, the response of the airplane, particularly in my, in my my opinion, in the back seat, was I couldn't believe it. And the first thing I did was look out both sides to make sure the wings were still there. And so basically, uh, and, and I, I'm sure bio is, is well used to this. Next is get up on the right side and see the G meter, right? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I did, and it was pegged. I don't remember what it's like. What it, it I think was, it pegged it was, a 10, if I remember right, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it was all the way over, right? So <laughs> I go back to looking around to see, you know, you know how, how severe is this thing? And I get back, I, I asked the, the Iranian, I said, how many Gs did you pull? 6.5, sir. <laughs> and he said, you know, I, I used more explicit language, but I told him I didn't believe him. And I looked up, and of course, it had been reset, right? So we got the airplane back. I said, we're going home. And the... It, there was absolutely, I, I've seen it on some of the Navy airplanes too, is the overwing fairing had some fingers on the back. Right. And the negative pressure that he created on the top of the airplane was such that it lifted the overwing fairing and, and, and folded the fingers mm -hmm. underneath. So anyways, damage to the airplane, none. That we could ever find. So... Amazing. So you say, well, okay. So the airplane is structurally bulletproof. Well, that's not true. Because basically, we roll the airplane, as you guys know, with the horizontal tails. Uh -huh. So if you envision the aft fuselage of the airplane, and you do a straight pull-up, you put bending loads in the aft fuselage. Okay. Now, if you take and you, in level flight, do a, a level roll, you're putting dors torsional loads on the, on the uh, aft fuselage. In this case, they'll be in one direction on one side of the airplane, the opposite direction on the other side. So, and the airplane is designed to handle that, but the Achilles heel was if you put a lot of, of positive G on the airplane and then roll the airplane, is at least on one side of the airplane, you're adding torsional loads to the bending loads. It's actually relieving on the other. So if you get the concept, the, the way you could damage this airplane is asymmetrically because you know it, 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 it will handle everything that is designed to do uh, uh, in a symmetrical and asymmetric, but not together. So basically, I think a lot of the, uh, in the fighter community, anybody that says, I haven't, I've never exceeded the as asymmetric maneuvering limits on my airplane, can't be trusted because <laughs> it, it happens. Yep. yep. And so basically, what's the solution to this? If you had fly-by-wire, the fly-by-wire says, oh, I know what the normal G is. Oh, now you want to roll the airplane? I'm only going to give you so much differential tail to roll the airplane. So in other words, it's going to protect the airplane uh, structurally. All right? Easy, easy to do, and but... With our control flight control system, you can't do it. Right. So it's uh, it it really I lost, and I did from way back when I, I got involved with going with the X twenty nine program, which was totally fly by wire, and and although I did I I knew it before that the magic that fly by wire can do is amazing. And so if that had been retrofitted into the airplane, uh, and, but it's not a cheap, it's not cheap, but guess what? 
That's exactly what the Air Force is doing now with the F-15. The, the EX, the new revitalized F-15, they're going full fly-by-wire control system in it. So, uh, you know, the F-14 with, with fly-by-wire in it would be incredible. The, to make the airplane do what you want, you, you need aerodynamic authority. We had it in spades. And you also need the ability to keep you out of where you're going to do structural damage to the airplane. So uh, the F-14 with a full fly-by-wire system. Amazing. What you could do. And all the things that, uh, you know, the question will be, well, wait a minute, I, I, I think you put a digital flight control system in the airplane toward the end of its service life. Well, that was not really. It was, the stuff was calculated digitally and everything, but it wasn't a fly-by-wire control system. So it didn't have the capabilities that fly-by-wire would have. That's an impressive recap. I tell you that I think that was just a question of, hey, let's talk flying characteristics. And holy cow, I think we just, uh, I learned a lot <laughs> just now. That was a Well, I'll, I'll tell you another thing, and I'll bet you you violated this. Uh -oh. is that How do you know? We're back to, we're, well, <laughs> you tell me if you're going to be honest. So <clears throat> there's an accelerometer that we've already discussed, right? It is a mechanical uh, G meter, right? So what we found out very early in that our development airplanes had an accelerometer mounted at the CG of the airplane that electronically drove a gauge in the cockpit. So it, it was very, very accurate. What we noticed is that the correlation between what we were seeing on the instrumentation and what was appearing on the cockpit gauge was significantly different. And not surprisingly, it was associated with high pitch rates. So it was the uh, inertia effects of the needle lagged it considerably. <laughs> <The needle. laughs> so we knew from a flight test standpoint, if you wanted to put six and a half Gs on it symmetrically, you had you could do it at 270 knots. And I know for a fact that in the rag, to show people how much instantaneous G was available, that the syllabus said, set 325 knots and then do a rapid pull up. And that would give them six and a half Gs on the accelerometer, on, a, on the production one. But it really put seven and a half, if not a little bit more, on the airplane. Interesting. <laughs> uh, so, you know, were we concerned about it? Once again, the, the symmetrical strength of the airplane was never in question. But rolling pulls, I do remember, you know, uh, we did a lot of shoot, especially in like uh, uh, surface air missile defenses and things like that. A rolling pull is the best thing to do, but you had to be careful. I remember thinking that we wanted to be limited to like four and a half Gs if we were rolling while pulling. I, I, yeah, something yeah like that. I don't remember exactly. I, I'm envisioning that that uh, chart in the NATOPS yeah. manual. It, it is. Yeah, I, like well, I did not have that memorized. All I know is like I, I, something less and uh, well, there's no way no. to know. And if you're, and if you're thrown into that environment, the last thing you do is get your checkout and say, well, how many, <laughs> how many Gs can I put here? Right? So, you know, basically, that's, I, I keep coming back to this fly-by-wire thing, is you just, the pilot can, can tell it what it wants and what have you, but it can be programmed to say that, okay, but at this symmetrical level, this is how much differential tail I'll give you. So, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's frustrating that the capability and it, it, I, 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 I have thought that the fly-by-wire control systems really came less than 10 years after the F-14 was designed. 
you know, the initial one was, I think the F-16 and, and the F-18, whatever. And almost if, if we had delayed development of the airplane till that, I'm sure it would have gone in the airplane. Yeah. But yeah. to retrofit it was a different, a different question. So, so Kurt, when we were uh, prepping for this, I uh, looked, I looked through this uh, great magazine and it's uh, got an interview with you and i think somewhere in there they're talking about high speed uh, flight did you do uh, any high speed testing on the f-14 <laughs> what was that like well once again i'll reiterate my fleet experience was crusader and phantom right both airplanes have a significant low altitude speed capability uh, my recollection is they're both 750 but i could be wrong but Anyways, both airplanes uh, it have in a flight control system where they have dampers in a pitch damper uh, and what have you. So I don't know if you've ever seen the video of the initial development of the F-4. They were doing a low altitude speed attempt and he got and into a PIO. PIO. Yep. And... There, so the bottom line it was it was you could go there with either airplane, but you make sure that your stability augmentation system is on, and don't do anything stupid with the stick to get something started, right? So it wasn't too long after I had joined Grumman, and we were in a flight brief, and going through the cards and one of them we had just made a small change to the eddy current damper which is in the longitudinal control system it, it's not important you understand what it is but it is it's it's a piece of equipment in your longitudinal control system so we had to demonstrate that there were no adverse uh influences of the new or the revised one anywhere in the envelope so the card read, okay, so the flight condition is 5,000 feet, 800 knots. <laughs> and as you guys know, the airplane steps right out there. You don't have to wait long or what have you. And I'm saying in my own mind, I said, okay, I'm going to be so careful when I get out there. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to even hold the stick. I'm going to I'm not going to induce any kind of a PAO. So then the next step of the card was turn the pitch sass off. Oh and I said, now I'm thinking, I'm a new guy. They're, this is a big RF. They're going to they're gonna frighten me and what have you, but they're not serious about doing this. So I said, you know, this concerns me. No sweat. It'll be fine. <laughs> so <clears throat> now I'm out there with the pitch sass off. Once again, being very, very careful. And they say, okay, now give it a stick wrap. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a flight test kind of thing is when you're checking damping and what have you, is you <laughs> take your fist and you, and you punch you, you hit the stick, in this case, in the longitudinal axis to excite the airplane. And now I'm convinced this is an RF, but they said, no, it'll be fine, what have you. So off we went. And the airplane was actually heavily damped, more heavily damped after the stick ramp than it was with the SAS sign. It, it's amazing to me. Uh, I've been, you know, 800 knots at low altitude and it, I mean, it, we didn't have any trouble getting there, but it, it actually, it didn't feel like we would go much faster. I, I went to 1.1. 1 .1, so that's, that's maybe not 800 knots, but getting close to it. So, well, that was a, that was the limit of the envelope. Uh, but I'll, I'll be without going into details. I'm aware of at least once it, the airplane was out to eight, 57. Not intentionally. But Is that you guys in flight test, you mean? 
somewhere in the process. Okay. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of things. I, most people aren't aware. Do you think the airplane has ever been take, taken off in oversweight? I'm going to guess it has, <laughs> based on the way you're I asking know. that question. I did, I did not personally witness it, but it was related to me. You're kidding. No, I wasn't. The rotation but, speed without, has got to be incredible to actually make that work. Yeah. Uh, two, two, uh, 250, something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did not personally witness it. Something else I have witnessed standing in the LSO position. I, I witnessed the airplane being landed at 25 and a half feet per second. Now, that, that is, is uh, 1,500, oh, 25 and a half. That's, they, that's VSI at 1,500. They, the design six speed of the airplane was 25.2 feet per second. Now, what's different about the structural thing in the carrier suit environment is there's no margins. Right. So theoretically, if it were a perfectly designed airplane, and you landed it at 25.3, everything would break. Right. Obviously, that's not the case. In this case, there wasn't any damage to the airplane. That had to look like a darn crash. Somebody coming down, because that's crunch. That's, well, that's, that's two and a half times. Exactly. So typically, we land right about 700, yeah. 750 feet per minute. 25.2 feet per second is roughly 1,500. BSI, I thought BSI was 600. Well, anyway. this, is how, this is how sadistic. Nav areas uh, when you're doing the structural demonstration, you, know, you have to you have a choice. You can demonstrate limit sink speed, speed twenty five two once, or you can demonstrate eighty percent of it three times. And so, which comes out to be like twenty point three something like that. So you say, well, what do you learn? If you get one at that speed, oh, incidentally, you have to do it in three different pitch attitudes. You have to do it in mean pitch attitude, nose low, and tail low. And you achieve that by flying at a different speed, you know, for whatever glide slope you require to get to six speed. So, so basically, what do, what do they learn by making you do it three times? It's the vulnerability that you're going to overshoot. And they'll get data that they can't realistically ask anybody to go get, but they'll get it. <laughs> right. So it's a game. It's a game when you're when you're the pilot to, to not give them any more than the requirement. <laughs> so it, it's uh, interesting enough. When they did the before all this went on, this included no slow high sink, which was essentially three point. So they did the analysis and they said, we're concerned about the safety of the pilot. As you know, the they landing, nose landing gear is fairly close to underneath the pilot. So they said, we're concerned about physical injury to the pilot. And the other thing is that all of these other uh, attitudes have to be an arrestment. They have a Mark 7 there at Pax River. So that in order to be valid, it has to be an arrestment. But obviously, we had a, to get the attitude for the nose low, we had to fly 160 knots. And the Mark 7, there wasn't any way that it, it could arrest you, whatever. So they said, well, just a touch and go is good enough. So anyways, they, they came up with a energy absorbing seat. And you're all familiar with the seat pan that goes in the seat. Take the seat pan out and you put this energy absorbing seat in it, which you can think of it as a piston that would stroke when under load and it, it, it was probably six or eight inches of throw, but that was going to make it tolerable for the pilot. Well, I can tell you that 
the most disconcerting thing of it was when you made the point and you succeeded in touching down at, at that sink speed and what have you, and the seat operated, that obviously you're not arrested, so you're, you're, you're taking off again. But because this hydraulic actuator had stroked, you're sitting about six or eight inches lower in the cockpit. <laughs> so it's, it's the weirdest sensation I can think of. You, you look to the right and you're looking at the canopy rail. So, anyways, it all worked out. The life of uh, a test pilot. Oh, wow. Yeah. The question. The question is: yeah. Did you did you think about it and realize that before you flew it, or was that one of those boom? Oh, we didn't think about that. <laughs> no, they 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 do their their damnedest, and obviously, I didn't I didn't end up with any injuries. We did have. A another incident which I won't go into detail, uh, <clears throat> but they had an inadvertent in-flight engagement, and when I say an in-flight engagement, it the airplane came in and picked up the Mark Seven, and it was caused by a late wave off. I was not involved, uh, but anyways, that. As you might imagine, the airplane and mill power climbing away engaged to the Mark 7 ain't going to happen, is not going to uh, end good. So it rotated the airplane down, and so it hit the, hit the runway nose gear first. Uh, it actually injured the pilot. I don't believe the seat was in the airplane at that time. Not that it would have made any difference. But it was an instrumented airplane. It was our carrier suit airplane. And the nose gear went to ultimate, which, as you know, in the loads area, there's a, you know, there's a, a limit load and then there's ultimate load. And, uh, and it, it appeared undamaged. They changed it. Just because for precautions for the rest rest of the program, but to say it was a tough airplane would be an understatement. Although when I started the program, I had one of the Grumman engineers. He said, "Kurt, I know you've been told that Grumman makes bulletproof airplanes. All the World War II stories about everything about Grumman." He said, "I just want to warn you." Those margins are not in this airplane. He said, there's no way we could have met the requirements and put those same margins in there. Hmm. But whatever was in there, it's an amazingly tough airplane. That's incredible. It really is. And I, you know, basically, if you look at Navy designs that are current, past, whatever, awful lot of them, in their career, end up with gear problems, you know, collapsing gear, landing gear, main gear, nose gear. F-8 was, had a weak nose gear. A lot of F-8s collapsed, nose gears, what have you. Well, when they do that, then Nav Air just ups all the requirements because they don't want to go through that again. And then, of course, in the current generation, they're all nose toe. So we were, we were the, along with the A-7, the first to go nose toe. So it's, I mean, you know the size of the nose gear. It's big. Wow. So that's, that's, that's amazing. It, it, like, it, if I could just, I, I got to, I want to sh shift gears for a second here and think about something else. So it, the F-14, when it was designed, was, you know, thinking about the HUD right now, just completely shifting away from flight control characteristics and things yeah. like that and thinking about the avionics. So the HUD was a, was kind of like a brand new thing at the time, right? I mean, this is, we, there's not a lot of. Well, I think the A7 was the first. I American. was going to say yeah, that's true. Now you're, yeah, I guess it. But it was it was you're, relatively new. Yeah. yeah. You're you're getting into communities, and the A7, as Bio said, was incorporating mm -hmm. the HUD, and the F F14, uh, obviously was a hunt, yeah. right? 
you would think that the two communities would have a common uh, meetings, if you will, about uh, these are things to avoid or these are things to be aware about, what have you. Well, it, they they were doing their thing and the fighters guys were doing their things. And the reason I'm so convinced of it is <clears throat> before I left Pax River, I had a chance to fly an A7E, which was their first production airplane that had the HUD, what have you. And I was amazed. And, you know, I, I, the point I made is that if I was flying a GCA in the A7, and for whatever reason, I decided that I would go uh, 400 knots until I get the call that uh, you're commencing glide slope or you're approaching glide slope commence rate of descent. I could do it in the A7 because you just come in at whatever 1,200 feet, whatever that the GCA altitude was, and you'd say, okay, uh, you're uh, approaching glide slope, begin a normal rate of descent. You'd come to idle and you'd force the velocity vector down three and a half degrees, and you'd probably never leave leave the glide slope. I mean, you'd be deselling the whole time, but that that in itself, in a normal airplane, was would be very difficult to do. But the HUD made it easy. So then I get to the F-14, and I find out that we first of all the initial HUD had had a, a combiner glass inside the windshield. And that helped field of view and everything else. The bad news was when they somebody was in the airplane at night and the reflections and everything that was going on and said, this isn't going to work. And so they took the combining glass out and went to windscreen projection. But the biggest sin of all is the initial airplane did not have an, an inertial horizon. So you start, think, start thinking about flying a HUD, how much you depend on the inertial horizon. Of all the benefits of the HUD, of, you know, say a, uh, a low altitude turn where you don't want to be losing any altitude or the GCA, whatever. We did not have, we did not have an inertial horizon. We had a dial horizon, which was useless, right? Wow. And so the F-14, and <clears throat> at that point, I, I don't, I think the fleet had to live till, was it the initial B modifications that got a reasonable HUD? I'm not sure. The D obviously got uh, an upgraded, upgraded HUD. <laughs> Do you remember Crunch? Well, later on, we got I know the, guys we, the B upgrade, got the Vitig R, the, I can't remember what the R stood for, retrofit or something like, refer, you know, the yeah. Vitig R was a real big upgrade. Uh, the F-14D obviously had a very nice one, but before that, the F-14A and straight B had that, that old HUD, yeah. but uh, uh, I remember it would precess significantly and uh, it was, it was difficult to use. And there were plenty of people who would actually turn it off when they were landing at the boat. Yeah, it was a disaster that, with the benefit of hindsight, that when the whole concept, you know, I, I, this is my imagination. They have a whole room full of fighter pilots, and they say, okay, well, how many people want a hut? Oh, I've heard good things. We all want a hut. Okay, but then not to go and find people that were flying huds. To me, I mean, it, the HUD is, I, I would think that, I, and I never was operational in a HUD, HUD equipped airplane, but I, I suspect, well, you hear about it, HUD cri cripples, you know, guys on the ship at night and they were 
asking them if, if if the HUD's not working, let paddles know. I mean, I, and, and that's not a, that's not a criticism of an individual. It's just the the benefit it gives. Yep. It, it's a tool in. that you get accustomed. That's your habit. That's what you do. And if you're the LSO, I was an LSO. And if you're come, if you've got a guy coming aboard who's doing something different than normal, you just want to know. And it might be a fine pass. You go, hey, sure. he comes aboard, no HUD. Hey, great, looks good. All right, no yeah. problem. But you want to know because the, the things you might normally say might be different. Well, if if you think that was a problem back in your days, now with a uh, the new mm. software, uh, magic carpet. What do they call it. It's a uh, magic mm-hmm. carpet that, you know, I, I actually, I had the chance, the guy that developed that, he and I worked together with the F-14, but he was hamstrung with all the hardware limitations we had, but we talked about the concept and what have you. And then he tried and he, he he eventually ended up in higher levels of nav air, and he tried to get that in airplanes and airplanes, and it wasn't until I think the F-35 uh, they developed it for the F-35, and he piggybacked it for the F-18. So the the E's and F's got it, and I think they're backfitting it on there. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who are, who are kind of like, well, what's going to happen when all of a sudden basically landing at the air, the ship is almost automated. What happens when it breaks? Do we suddenly have people who are no longer able to land aboard the ship? Oh my God, this is terrible. And every, it's basically a paradigm shift in how we do business. But ultimately, if you're, if you think about it from the point of view of the strike group commander or the carrier CEO, it's about sea space and the ability that you know that you're going to land first pass and you're going to get everybody aboard and then you can turn, you can manage the sea space and your your combat effective more. It's just that every once in a while, I, I don't know how often that system fails. I completely don't know. You come up with a well, different solution than you would normally it, do, that's all. And then the answer is yeah. redundancy. Yeah. But, I, you know, once again, it's all it's symbology mm-hmm. on the HUD. So to me, it's pretty obvious if the HUD goes away, you're back to flying a normal airplane. And you don't fly the airplane normally. I mean, the, the cues that you're mm-hmm. following on, on magic carpet, uh, it's, it's obviously yeah. effective and everything else. But we went through the same thing with APC, approach power control. They said, well, I'm not using it because if I get used to depending on it, then it's going to fail, fail me at some point. Yep. Mm-hmm. So. Hey, Kurt, let's talk yeah. about one of the most distinctive features of the F-14, the wing sweep. Do you have any, any thoughts, good or bad, about the wing sweep? I mean, in my experience, three different squadrons, 2,500 flight hours, we have very few issues with the wing sweep. And, and I read a... Uh, an article that falsely claimed the wing sweep added complexity to the F-14. So that wasn't true uh, in my experience. Uh, but what do you think about the whole wing uh, sweep? I, w- I would I would add it on the obvious must-haves, you know, and, and <clears throat> you know, people worried about, uh, you're probably aware of the fact that someone said, well, what if it fails? Yeah. And, of course, there's all kinds of ways to prevent that from happening. But they said, worst case, is you've got one, one, one wing fully swept and the other fully forward. And we actually they did a flight test with that. And, and uh, our chief test pilot at the time, Chuck Sewell, did the work. And he concluded that it was a reasonable uh, <clears throat> capability on a field, but obviously not for the boat. So, but... You know, wing sweep failures, they, Grumman engineers, bless their hearts, they, you probably have heard of the titanium wing box. Yes. And that's the heart of the whole thing. The, the electronics in it, compared to what's available now, is, were prehistoric. But they worked. You know, the CADC, which controls the wing sweep, was being touted as the latest and greatest. Well, technology. 
that's still um, it, it's vying for the world's first microprocessor. The yeah. guy who invented, but the reason that everybody in the world doesn't know about it is because the Navy kept it a secret for uh, 20 years. Yeah. But the wing sweep, fully automatic wing sweep. So you, you're a fan of wing sweep and it was required to meet the design requirements, right? Performance requirements. Well, I, you know, I, I for a whole bunch of reasons, I, I would tout the F-14 as the absolute best designed airplane that that you could could uh, envision, and we went through growing pains. Fuel system is is another thing that we didn't get into, but it was new technology that we're not going to have electric pumps in the fuel transfer system. We're going to do it with motor flow. And oh, by the way, the A7 uses this quite successfully. Well, the A7 has a peak flow rate to supply the engine of, I'm guessing, eight or eight or 9,000 pounds an hour. And of course, they have 14 low altitude in zone five. It's, I mean, it's that the amount of minute. fuel that's got to be moving around. <laughs> 2,000 oh, yeah. pounds a minute. And, and we went through a lot of growing pains, not the least of which that the initial NATOPS was incorrect. And the reason I know that is when I checked the board, they put it on my desk and said, learn the fuel system and correct this. And hopefully it made a difference. Part of it was understanding how the, how the thing actually operated. That for years, there was this thing about super straw, how all this fuel goes through this great big pipe. And it's, it's not true at all. Not that it matters, but... I think as it matured, I don't, you guys would know, I mean, fuel systems were not a big problem area, I would think. Uh, they became a big problem in the end. Uh, we started having a lot more issues well, back I, at the end, but uh, that's a discussion for another I day. Had a I, single engine, I had a single engine emergency early in my career that turned into a fuel emergency, but we survived. Mm -hmm. So, Well, here's, a, here's, here's what I'll add to that is the fuel system vulnerability lies to sensors that are here that trigger something else happening and what right. have you. So if that sensor doesn't work or what have you, then you're going to see weird stuff. Once again, going back to a fly-by-wire airplane with a central computer, all this stuff is not only redundant, but it's like four. I mean, and you can add a sensor, and you, you, we went through this with the X-29, is it just, it, everything, everybody gets its own answer, and then it meets and says, what answer do you have? And if all four agree, fine. If only three agree, they say, the, you know, the, the, the fourth guy goes, go away. What have you? So you have levels of redundancy, plus you have knowledge of what the hell is going on. And that's the problem with the fuel system is all you had to do, all you had to go with was the fuel quantity yeah. indicators. Yeah. And I, I remember those indicators being a little, I mean, they were just little rotating dials and sometimes they just didn't see you. You're, it, we, I used to always joke that uh, if I was running low on gas, I would lower my seat so that I, it would look like I had more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, it's something I, I want to I want to make sure you get in this broadcast. Okay. Is I had the pleasure of what was called pre-deployment update for the F-14D. Oh. And and so we we had our own airplane. It was an aircraft seven, and basically we were dictated to do the program at the Naval Air Test Center. We would have preferred to do it up in Calverton. I won't go into why. But anyway, so we did it at Pax River. Well, if you're not familiar with Pax River, the test range is across controlled airspace out over the Atlantic Ocean. So between the test range and Patuxent, you've got controlled airspace, which is, we don't have that at Calverton. Nevertheless, 
the Navy provided our chase airplane. This was a essentially a structural program. So basically, they, our typical chase would become a F-18 single center line. They eventually took all the pylons off, cleaned it up as much as they could. They needed the center line because it was ridiculous without it. So we'd get out and let me tell you the configuration standard on ours. We had fuel tanks, external fuel tanks, that were non-functional. They were there only for aerodynamic reasons. They, in the tunnel, we had four Mark 84s. And they, uh, on the glove pylon, we had AIM 9s and HARM. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, Harm had never been cleared on the airplane. Right. So we had, the airplane was essentially loaded with bear. Yeah. For bear. Yeah. Right. So we would go out and we would, a lot of the, it just works out that a lot of the points are high speed. That the slow speed stuff, you can, you can get it done in, one half a flight, but the high speed ones, which require a lot of fuel to get to, they, they take longer. So we start out on one end of the warning area and get all set up to, to go down range. And we ideally, the chase we would want on a very loose wing position, stepped up, if you will, because if something happens that if it's of urgency, the sooner you know about it, the, the better you can deal with it. So we'd start the Excel, and obviously we'd go to the end point, and would say, maybe, maybe, uh, whatever it was. It normally, it'd be supersonic. It'd be somewhere around thirty thousand feet or what have you. And the F-18 would be three to four miles behind us. And so we said, well, this is, we need, potentially, we need you to get there sooner. So we ended up with a, a uh, area chase. So you would take the acceleration rate and you'd station the F-18 holding about halfway down. So if something happened, he could get to you relatively quickly. Well, so we're doing all these excels with it, with the kitchen sink on, what have you, and the F-18 would call bingo. And so we were truncating the flights. We were working with internal fuel only, but because, you know, we needed the chase, so when he went bingo, the, the flight was over. So it was just amazing to me. The F-110 was, uh, I, I really feel sorry for F-14 guys that never got a chance to fly the F-110 powered airplane. Uh, it was like incredible. So we had one instance with the F-110. And so basically, uh, it was a turn reversal at 15,000 feet, a limit G turn reversal, and did the maneuver. And for the first time, I heard a real quick pop from the engine. And we had seen no engine anomalies. So obviously, we recovered from the maneuver, and everything in the cockpit, instrument-wise, was normal. There was a significant instrument engine instrumentation in the airplane. All that looked normal. Of course, the, the throttles at idle at this time. And so eventually, here comes the F-18 to check on us. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know, we had an alloy on the, on the starboard engine. And so as he's closing in, 
he, he gets fairly close in. He said, oh, there's a big panel missing off the uh, AIM-54 fairing on the front, which is part of the configuration right. when right. you carry air to ground bombs. Right, heavy. And I, we're talking a panel that is probably two and a half feet by, I don't know, two feet. I mean, a huge panel. Yeah, big, right? yeah. So as, as he comes, comes aboard, he said, hang on a minute, uh, and I'll, I'll try to figure out where the panel went. I said, don't worry. I know where the panel went. <laughs> so right down we, the left, we left the engine at idle just for redundancy, hydraulics and, and electrical. Obviously aborted, went, went back to PAX. That engine was the biggest mess you'd ever want to see. It was immediately, it never, it was shit can. It never, uh, it was a total loss. But it sat there and ran. That's all amazing. Back. That you, so you 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 have this major engine fod, and all you have is a little pop, and it keeps running. Whereas yeah. an old TF thirty, yeah. you'd be like, well, "Oh my uh, god, <laughs> this is going to go bad." Well, oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. We just uh, had. There was another thing. That I don't know if if you ever experienced it. Did you ever you ever have a high mock stall in a TF thirty airplane? Yes. Okay, well, you can imagine what the reaction was of the guy who experienced it the first <laughs> time, because the it, you know it, it 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 put so much energy into the airplane. You're wondering something's going to come apart. So, I don't so know for why. those yeah, for those right. of the list, so so the listeners who have never experienced that, <laughs> describe what happened. <laughs> Well, what happens is that the engine stalls and then the inlet goes into buzz. And what happens is the shock moves in and out. And the obvious response to the engine stall is for the pilot to bring it back to idle. So they, they, uh, the shock moves in and out of the inlet. And I was looking for a way to describe it from a pilot standpoint. And I thought, you know, of a farmer that was driving his big tractor down the highway and then had a blowout on his big wheel that's next to him. You know, he just said, uh, oh, I don't know about this. Uh, so uh, anyways, it, as you got down and this would happen supersonic, so it would self-recover after uh, usually right before you went subsonic. And then the engine would would uh, operate normally. I mean, it was just an idiosyncrasy of the airplane. So they there were an awful lot of uh, things that the TF thirty brought in terms of excitement. Uh, <laughs> I, I I remember a story one time where I was flying. Uh, I was doing the flanker sim. I was a bandit, and uh, we had that. We're doing you know. We're going Mach one point something as we're going in. It was a Top Gun event, and all of a sudden I get the supersonic stall in my TF thirty, and you just—I mean, it's just a whack, whack, whack. You just—you feel like you're just riding a bucking bronco. And I remember the NATOP step was step one: take your feet off the rudders and put it on the floor. And that was—I uh, remember my Rio yelling at me, "Feet on the floor!" Because <laughs> it's, it's rather violent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I had. I had one happen to me with one of our development airplanes, uh, and we have nose booms on the airplane. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, oh, it's that probably long, that long probe. Yeah, I know feet, what you mean. Yeah, yeah, something like that, twelve feet. Anyways, you can see it obviously out the front of the airplane. And I was uh, at uh, like 1.5 at 15,000 feet. The severity of the of the Inlet, uh, the excitation in, is dependent on the faster you are, the bigger it is. And but so the engine stalled, it goes into buzz. But all you can do is just sit there and wait as the airplane decelerates, right? So I'm sitting there with nothing to do, uh, <laughs> and I'm looking out at the nose boom, and the nose boom starts coupling up with the frequency. 
And so now it's going around in Ooh. little circles. And uh, eventually I got down so that the stall cleared and what have you. But as soon as I, I put that into my flight report, we shortened all the nose booms on all the airplanes to change its natural frequency. Because I thought the nose boom was going to go. I was thinking, well, would it go over the top of the airplane? Or where will it go? And right yeah. down at start, intake. Start, well, probably not. It's anyway. going to rip something off. It's going to make a mess. So, another TF, TF-30 mm. thrill. So, Kurt. I think we could sit here and talk for another two hours, but uh, what what we'll really probably do is uh, start to wrap it up. And uh, yeah. I don't know if we get a gap in our schedule, we'll ask if you can come back and talk to us or something like that. Hey, do you have uh, do you have anything that's on your mind that you really wanted to cover today, or or you feel like you're? Uh, well, you know? uh, let me let me just make a sta- it's basically a statement because it's, uh, it's on our list is the specification requirement of the airplane was 2.4 Mach number. Right. And the TF-30 got it there. And it wasn't easy because they were were fighting the uh, inlet, tuning of the inlet and what have you, but eventually got the 2.41. So it was the Navy that decided that part of the envelope really was, was, well, I, I know part of their reason was the threat of uh, engine stalls out there raise some inlet structural concerns. So they didn't want to have to do that. So they arbitrarily just stuck it, you know, at 2, 2.0. But the airplane would, go, would get out there. Kurt, let me say uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, prepare for this and to be with us and to uh, to give our audience and Crunch and me, a, a real feel for what went into designing and testing the F-14 to make it uh, the memorable airplane that it is, and for, you know, reminding us of some of its great features and capabilities. So you've done just a wonderful job uh, uh, describing the Tomcat for us. Thank you. Well, a lot of, you know, just uh, one statement is, you know, obviously, like all of us, uh, you, you're interested in what's going on with the, the current aviation, naval aviation. And some of the things they're concerned about in terms of reach out and range and, and uh, uh, all that would have been solved, were solved with the F, F-14. But obviously, it's too late to do anything about it. Amazing air, amazing airplane. Yes, sir. All right. Well, well, Kurt, thank you so much for this. This is, as Bio said, an incredible education yep. for us, and I hope the listeners enjoyed it. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for coming out, and to all of our listeners, thanks for listening to the F-14 Tomcast. And uh, I would love to have you back for a, for a recap of some further issues. Well, uh, so far the memory is still there, most of it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We'll capture it, we'll capture right. it while it's still awesome. there. Well, I'll look forward to it. So anything I, any questions you have, you. give me a call. Awesome. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Kurt. Hey, so what a great interview that was. You know, Kurt did more than just fly test profiles. He actually made suggestions to the engineers that gave us improvements over the entire life cycle of the F-14. So in addition to some exciting flying stories, we also talked about, you know, the origins uh, of the nickname Turkey as well as talked about how the fuselage actually provides lift under higher angles of attack. And that's something that many of us had heard of before, but he gave us the real story. Come back for future episodes of the F-14 Tomcast. In episode two, we'll be talking to Streak and Lur about the introduction of the F-14A. You've been listening to the F-14 Tomcast, part of the Air Combat Experience, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at F14Tomcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101, extension 3. That's 877-622-4101, extension 3. 
For updates on this podcast and our other military aviation themed shows, visit BVRPro.com and follow the Air Combat Experience on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.